Where are we going today? So we're going back, double time. We're going back to San Bernardino, which is where we were on the last one, which okay. again, hopefully we'll get up with Clarence Craft. This is going to be uh, Joseph Rodriguez, who was born and raised in San Bernardino. Another San Bernardino guy. Correct. Okay. And then uh, we're going back to Korea. So a okay. uh, couple episodes ago, we had Rudolfo Hernandez yep. in uh, Korea. This is Joseph Rodriguez. Same time frame, similar, similar action, similar mountainous terrain, similar a lot of things. So, yeah. Yeah. Right on, dude. So he grew up in San Bernardino. What? What, where exactly? Yeah, so like a couple of uh, the episodes we've talked about, you know, they were they grew up in Colton and then they left, or they grew up in Redlands and then they left. Joseph Rodriguez went grew up in San Bernardino. I actually Googled his house on Elf Street in San Bernardino. It's oh, still wow. there. Yeah, he went to primary school. He went to San Bernardino High School. He went to San Bernardino Valley College. So he's a legit he local. Straight San Bernardino Born his whole raised. life. He's buried in Mountain View Cemetery on San Bernardino. Awesome. Yeah. So he's, he stayed in the Army for 30 years, so he did a lot of time overseas. Yeah. Um, he traveled the world. He lived in Texas for a while, but he came back, and he's, he's buried back here. And I believe That's his awesome. family is still in the area. Yeah? Do, do, does his family still have the home that he grew up in? I, I sincerely doubt it. Yeah. 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 I, like I said, I Googled it, and I, I thought about, like, it'd be interesting to go there and be like, hey, have you ever heard of uh, you yeah. know, a Medal of Honor recipient that used to live in this house? You know, I'm, yeah. sure, I'm sure they don't. It's a smaller little house on uh, L Street there. But So was San Bernardino a military city at the time? Uh, at the time, no. No, I mean, we've had Norton Air Force Base here since World War II, and a lot of the um, residents come from the Air Force Base, but yeah. the, there's also the local side, which is most of the people we've been talking about. They weren't here for the military aspect of it. So was it a military town? Yes, it has been because yeah. of Norton Air Force Base, but no in the sense that these guys weren't here, and they didn't join the military because of that. This just, okay. It just was happenstance with that. Uh, Interesting. Yeah, it seems like a lot come out of here. Yeah, well, it's, it was a, it's a bigger city. It used to be America's city, as they Could called it. Could it be because the Air Force Base was here that it generated a lot more interest in the military? Uh, it's hard to say. I mean, again, we're talking World War II and Korea when the whole country was, you know, waving flags well, yeah. and, and being pretty patriotic. Big difference in the patriotism yeah, at that exactly. time. Yeah, exactly. So we, we happen to have, you know, we're highlighting these local heroes, but there's a lot of places in the country you could go and highlight all these heroes. Are there too. specific places in the country that, that just generate a lot more? Yeah, there's a, uh, a town in New Mexico that has four Medal of Honor recipients. Oh, wow. Uh, I think it was New Mexico. Now I'm, now I'm drawing a blank, but they have their statues out there and everything. Hiroshi Miramura and all them, I believe. I watched a documentary on a Colorado Asian. Yeah. Medal of Honor Must, recipient. It might have been Qual Colorado then. Yeah. And they even had the video. His parents still had the video of him. Yeah, the parade that's, that he got. That's, that's Hershey. That's yeah, Hiroshi Hershey. Miramura. That's, that's who it was. Hiroshi Miramura. Yeah, he... Um, I think it was Truman, too, said there must be something in the water out here because yeah. they had so many heroes coming Is he the there. one that told him, I, wish, I would rather... Yeah, Truman's the, the one medal. that always said, I'd rather have the Medal of Honor. He told that to Hershey, you know? right? He said it to everyone. He gave oh, he did. Too. Yeah, okay. and it's funny because the more you read and the more you interview, some of the Medal of Honor recipients don't... They, it, they're not, it seems like they're not aware of that. It seems like he told me, like, I'm the only one, but Truman said it pretty... I've never heard one that got it from Truman where he yeah. didn't say that. So that Hershey was, was a cool story, man. Yeah. That was a really yeah, that cool was a great story. One. They and a good dude. They did a great job on that. Yeah. Most of them are great dudes. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> most. Yeah, most, yeah. Are there any horror stories? Yeah, like we talked about, um, there was the, uh, there's, there's one whose name I, I'm not going to mention right now, but he was killed in an armed robbery. He was the suspect. Oh, that's he, right. And then there was, um, you know, a lot of them have had, dealt with mental illness and PTSD yeah. and things like that. Not always easy to come back. And like I said, nowadays, Iraq and Afghanistan, the few survivors that have Medal of Honor, they're, they're kind of, you know, social figures, public figures, a lot of these other guys weren't, so some of them struggled coming back. Yeah. Some of them had problems in their lives, especially the further you go back, because they it's were kind of It's one of the troubles absorbed. with social media and stuff, huh? Some of these guys get it so young, yeah. and they still haven't gone through their life mistakes. Exactly. And so they're carrying this burden of this yeah. perfect American. Exactly. Oh, that's going to be a lot, lot of pressure. And that's what a lot of them talk about, too, all the pressure of the medal and trying to live up to the medal and being worthy of the medal. Yeah. And every, all eyes are on you all the time. So. Yeah, I heard that an interview with Dakota Meyer, who's mm -hmm. a young guy that, that got the Medal of Honor, and he he's talked about the struggle of trying to be this perfect American when you're not. Yeah, exactly. You, know what I mean? you weren't before and right. you weren't and you weren't during and yeah. and now you're expected to be you The know, medal's you, not changing your character. Yeah, and you represent something for everybody else. And the medal's not changing your character, but most of them are obviously they did something amazingly heroic and honorable, so they have that in them and yeah. they, they are afraid to let that down because they know what that means. And most Medal of Honor recipients say that they're wearing it for everybody else. They're wearing it for yep. the guys that didn't come home. They're wearing it for the other guys in their unit. So they're carrying that burden with them. Like, again, yeah. Kyle Carpenter said, it's, it's the, the weight of a nation on your shoulders. Right? Yeah. So you can't go out to a bar and get drunk. You can, but, I mean, if you do, then it's like, oh, you don't want to make a headline as... as yeah, dude. It, yeah, there's almost like this 
presumption that this is going to be a really st- a Brian Stan type of guy. Mm-hmm. If you watch the UFC, Brian Stan is like this yeah. all American type of dude. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. He doesn't make a lot of mistakes. He doesn't curse. He's just kind of on the straight and narrow. But man, some of these guys probably aren't that guy. Well, and again, you take a draftee uh, maybe didn't want to be there, or even you take now somebody who's 18, 19 years old. Like you said, they don't have a lot of that life experience. They don't have a lot of that. Yeah. Um, they ha- they all they've known was high school and then they're thrown into this this hellfire of battle yeah. and then they do something heroic and now they're expected they may to not that even know that they life. had that in them exactly and now, the and now that's you yeah. you know yeah. some of these guys especially throughout history like you talked about before um you you see them when they're 10 you see them when they're 15 you see them when they're, tw- they're gearing up to go into the military that's all they want yeah there's other guys when it was just a, something they did and now that's defining them for the rest of their yeah, life. yeah dude ever since i started uh this show with you i got way into the military stuff so i've been watching all this crazy and that is a one of the big things that i noticed i listen to jocko's podcast a lot jocko willink and you, you hear his story and he said that he was a kid in yeah. the in the four i mean he all he ever wanted to do was be a soldier but right. then you like a guy like kyle carpenter he may be that guy mm-hmm. but you can see the pain in him dude yeah. where he's like man this is a burden mm-hmm. a big time burden so or sal june so like i talked about he went to he went down to the army recruiter he worked at subway and they were offering a free shirt free army shirt so he's like oh, i need a free shirt so he went and down that's and, what the motivator and, was and then he you know then when he started talking to him he's like oh you know this seems like a good idea yeah it wasn't that he was anti-military or or not thinking about it because obviously he would never went into the office in the first place but it wasn't this lifelong passion you know yeah. it was oh, i'll go check that out and then there yeah. you go and then that's yeah that's, there is a big difference because some of the guys are just born and bred they still would go back right now in right. a second even with kids a family and everything else yeah. you know so that is a that is a big contrast. I wonder where that comes from. Is it just maybe just bred into you, or it's just like anything else? Why are some people athletes? Why are yeah. some people not? Some Do you people, still have that urge? I've wanted to go back in the military since the day I got out. Really? Yeah. So for me, I, I did a very short term. But like I said, I'm not I'm not an athlete. I'm not a physical person. Yeah. It was very hard for me being in the army. But I've you know I've thought about going back in the Air National Guard. I thought about joining the reserves. I thought. You ask my wife, there's, there's how, it, probably once every year or two years, I'm just sitting there or I'll watch something or I'll talk to an old friend and I just, I felt guilty yeah. being out when other people are over there. Why did and you then, get out? Uh, well, I, I had only ever intended to do one enlistment and get yeah. out. You know, I just wanted to serve my country and that was my obligation. I did it and I wanted to be yeah. on with it. And I was very happy to get out. I, I ran out the door when oh, I was Oh, did gone. you? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, the army's not, or the military's not all combat. You know, the military is uh, mopping concrete in the rain and, you know, yeah. living in whole, just stupid nonsense yeah. sometimes. Yeah. So it's frustrating, man. And when you're, again, I was, I went in when I was 18. So you're watching all your high school friends, they're partying, they're doing this and that, they're going to college, they're moving on with their lives, and you're in the field for a week, you know, and yeah. you're like, man, I want to, I want to, oh, be so part you of feel that. like life is like, passing yeah, it's you passing by. you by, exactly. And then yeah. you get out and you're like, I didn't miss anything. I, oh, <laughs> then it's like, man, that <laughs> life wasn't passing me by, it was running you guys over because <laughs> yes. you're, yeah, but it, but you feel that way at a certain time, and especially yeah. if, you know, for someone like me, like, I didn't make friends easy. So it's not like I have established these roots. So I was stationed in Texas. It was like, Oh, I'm missing all my friends back here. I'm missing yeah. my family. You're watching all that kind of stuff. You want to get home. So it's hard. Never knowing where you're going to be. We, um, I was stationed in Texas, but it was before we deployed, we were supposed to deploy in, um, 2003. Uh, and then they ended up canceling our order. So for that whole year, it was like, we were on like standby from 2003 to 2004. And it was like, Oh, what are we going to be, you know, you expect to be, we're stationed in Texas until we leave. Well, it's like, well, now you're going to Louisiana, JRTC for a month. So it's like, shit, you gear up to that. It takes a while to get over there. You you do a month there. Then you come back. You're like, oh, okay, now we'll get free time. Oh, now you're going to NTC, which is Fort Irwin, California. Right. You're going to, so it's like, man, you, you can't even plan. Every military podcast I listen to sounds like that. Yeah, and, I, and I was single, but the married right. guys with kids, it's, it's a hard life. I couldn't imagine, mm-hmm. man. You, it's got to be number one, right? Yeah. I mean, and, you, you got to have a girl that's real understanding. And it tears a lot of families apart. Absolutely. Um, you know, Is think, the divorce rate high? Oh, it's got to be, it's, right? It's, it's, that's the old joke. If you're, if you're like a staff sergeant, you have to have at least two divorces. And oh, all okay. Like, it's a, every, you can't. It's, it tears families apart. It, yeah. it really does. And I'm not saying that as like, oh, the Army's negative or this and that. It's just, it's just the reality of it. Being gone a lot, not being able to plan. Um, a lot of the, if you're in the military, the man or the woman, you're, you're struggling, you're working your ass off, you're doing all these things. So then they kind of expect their spouse, you need to do everything else. Yeah. And then, you know, and they get home and the spouse is like, well, I'm struggling with the kids and I'm struggling yeah. with this and that. And they're struggling emotionally and behaviorally in school because you're gone all the freaking time. Yeah. You know? and, and being a six-year-old, or, or, or a four-year-old, you and your dad it. leaves for a year, yeah, and then he comes back, you know, and trying to reintegrate and get to know him, and now, oh, now we're changing duty stations, say goodbye yeah. to all your friends, and this and that. I and tattoo a, a family of five, husband, wife, in the military. She might be civilian, but she works at a hospital. Yeah. He works in the hospital 
on base or something, and then they have three kids. Yeah. And they travel and they move every five years yeah. voluntarily. Like right. they want to be stationed somewhere else. And dude, they are on. Uh, but it, but it was so cool to see an integrated family that loves it. Yeah. You know what I mean? There's a lot that that tears them apart. But this particular family, it was so cool to see how on board they. You didn't see the kids going, "Oh man, <laughs> I got pulled out." They love it. They right. like every five years something new all well, over that's the world. Good, but so that's a, it's a little. It's probably rare. Abnormal in a sense, yeah. Because yeah, it, it's it's hard. I'm, I would have never done it with a wife and kids. That's yeah. why I was looking into the National Guard and all that. It's a little different, but it's still very. You know, a lot of guys when I was in. We're in the National Guard. They think one weekend a month, two weeks a year, whatever. And then they got deployed. You know, yeah. year long deployment isn't a year long deployment. It's a three up, three month train up that they're away from their family. Yeah, th- then a year, then they come back, and then it's like two. A lot of those National Guard guys were doing fifteen months away. You know, that's yeah. That's, when on Jocko's podcast, he was talking about the Battle of Fallujah, mm-hmm. and one of the one of his supporting forces was the National Guard unit. And he was just talking about how they were right there with him. They're yeah. doing the same exact, same exact stuff. thing everybody else is. And yeah. you know, you first you see him and you talk your crap and stuff. But I think in 2004, 2005, almost 50% of the troops in country were Reserve or National wow. Guard guys. Yeah. And again, when I was there, Marines were doing, I think, seven month tours. Some of the Air Force guys were doing like four months. The Special Forces guys were popping back and forth. But the Army was 12 month deployments, and then they turned into 15 month deployments. Dang. 15 months. Without coming home once? Without, you get to come home in the middle of it for leave for two weeks. But 15 months being away from your family is, is insane. Yeah, who's going to be able to keep a, it together? Right. It's a terrible thing to ask, but it's, that's the burden that all these guys were voluntarily doing at that yeah. time. You know, guys were re-enlisting Man. and guys were going over for it. What a trip. So we are headed back to Korea. The yeah, Forgotten back to War. Korea. The Forgotten War again. Yeah. So just like we talked about... Um, hellacious battles you know human waves of hell as they called them the, the extreme colds to the to the extreme mud to the extreme heat and all that that seesaw battle that was going on so at the same time rudolfo hernandez was in country so was joseph rodriguez our our san Bernardino native he was they together the seventh no they were different units so if you remember i don't know if you remember when we were talking about um rudolfo I'm going to start mixing up names going yeah. back and forth. When we were talking about Rodolfo, I, I mentioned that the, um, the North Koreans invaded. They pushed the South Koreans and the U.S. troops all the way down to the south. Yep. It looked like we were a losing battle. And then MacArthur invaded at Incheon and cut in behind them. Yeah. Right? So in this amazing chess move, you know, all guts and glory, let's, let's give it our Hail Mary pass. They invaded. That was the Marine Corps because they're the experts in amphibious landing and the 7th Infantry Division, which is where uh, Joseph Rodriguez was. Yeah. So he was one of, the, one of those troops that... Um, so we're going back to the same war that we did a couple episodes with Rudy or Rudolfo Hernandez, San Bernardino local. Now we're going on to... Who was Joseph it? Rodriguez. Joseph Rodriguez. San Bernardino, yeah. San Bernardino. Rudy so. was from Colton and uh, Joseph was from San Bernardino. Okay. So like you talked about before, Joseph is a uh, second, or I'm sorry, a first generation American. Yeah. His dad was from Mexico. His family's from Mexico. Like I said, spent his whole life in San Bernardino. San Bernardino High School. I think the Cardinals, San Bernardino? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I think my uh, in-laws went there. That's pretty bad of, that I don't know that, but yeah. Yeah. But he went to the high school there. He went to San Bernardino Valley College, and he was uh, drafted in 1950. So... Oh, so he was drafted. Yeah, most of these guys were at this really? point. Yeah, but, it, but it, draft has a negative connotation. It's not like, oh, I hate my country, and now I have to go fight, and I, you know, it's go to jail or go to war. Because he actually said, he said, I didn't ask for it, but I didn't turn it down. Yeah. Uncle Sam called me up, so I went. So he was proud to serve. He thought I always it was thought draft obligation. was negative, too. A lot of people see it that way. Um, I mean, this is a, a whole side issue for another show, but a lot of the... Uh, image that we have of Vietnam veterans in the Vietnam War is is pure almost propaganda and it's painted a certain way and it's painted yeah. by the media a certain way because of the language that they use and you know um, you think of World War II you think of all volunteers you think of Vietnam you think of all draftees for the most part right? yeah in Vietnam the, at no point in the war was there over 35 percent of the troops in country were ever draftees they were all they were mostly volunteers so at least two-thirds of the troops at country at any time were volunteers, enlisted guys. Those draftees, just because you were a draftee didn't mean you hated your country and you didn't want to fight. A lot of guys were waiting, would just wait for the draft. Yeah. Because if you enlisted, it's three years. You're going to get drafted anyways. Draft's two years. So they're just like, oh, you know, I'll, I'll just wait to see if my number's up. If, my, if the country needs me, I'll go. If they don't, then, you know. So maybe like draft life. dodger and all that stuff kind of. Well, the draft dodger is a different thing. Well, but, but I mean, a, maybe but that's dra- why it. Yeah, there's, there's quite a few of those Medal of Honor recipients were drafted. You know, that doesn't mean anything negative yeah. in that sense. It, by, by no huh? means. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of great heroes were drafted. There were guys that were drafted, never thought about the Army in their life, and then they ended up, you know, making a career out of it, too. So a lot of people are dreading that, though, right, the draft? Yeah, I mean, it's a... 
Think about what that means. Do you yeah. think about, again, I enlisted, I wanted to go, but think about you when you were 18. If somebody, you know, you, you went to the mailbox one day and there was a letter there and then it said, hey, you have X amount of days and you need to report to the, to the um, recruiter yeah. or whoever and you're, you're leaving I'd have to take now. my Jinko jeans off. Yeah. <laughs> You'd have to take a lot of things. I don't cut think my they, hair. I don't think they would have wanted you. <laughs> no. They would have turned you right back around. <laughs> you're, you're, you're parted in the hair, bleach blonde hair. <laughs> but... Uh, but for, yeah, I'm not the <laughs> but for everybody else, this was the reality, right? You have X amount of days, say goodbye to your family, say goodbye to your girlfriend, say goodbye to whatever. And your then plans where do they were. go? Same, is it the same setup as if you were enlisted? Yeah. So they're going to, you get to, when you get to basic training, you're there with everybody else. So Joseph went to Fort Ord, California. Which Are you is, going with enlisted guys? Yeah. Or is it so, all drafties? This you're mixed. Okay. Once you get there, everybody's a body. I was going to say, man, if it was all, all draft, shit. that'd be a tough. No. You don't he, think so? Uh, morale no you, w- you wouldn't want to do that yeah exactly saying. everybody because then when you get out you wouldn't want to be like oh well you went to the drafty boot camp right I, right no everybody's integrated you're all you're all equal and you're all scum the, yeah. you're all you're all trash um that's at how this you get time could the, could the guys hit you and stuff you know that's that's exaggerated too Is it? um god every, i'm just such like the cliche non-military yeah. so guy, this, dude. there's probably a lot of people listening that or if people are listening that went to boot camp when i went in they used to punch us no they didn't yeah no they didn't. i never got hit i never got put hands on me they would do things that would make you wish they would just hit him yeah um arlie ermy in full metal jacket yeah i've read hit many interviews on him i have a book on marine drill sergeants and they asked him specifically was it like that and he said we would never ever hit the troops i never would have choked him and he was a real one right yeah he was a real drill so he yeah. said we never would have choked him he said the worst you would do is kick him in the ass if they were moving too slow oh, so and, it was, and it was yeah but he said it was so frustrating because you know they're sending all these bodies to Vietnam and they shorten the boot camp and things are going, so they'd start kicking them. But he said he would have never, ever choked anybody. He would have never tolerated another drill sergeant yeah. choking anybody. You know, that's, that's a lot. Of, a lot of guys want to add mystery to their right. time. Oh, you know, they used to hit us and now they have stress cards. No, they don't. No, yeah. they didn't. Shut up. Yeah. Just, you know, yeah. so no, they, they weren't hitting them, but they would make your life hell, right? Yeah. It's, um, you don't need to hit me to make me go run up and down the hill until I can't stand up and people are making me crawl, you know, or making you run till you throw up or, or crawl around on the floor. And How bad like was that. it? For me, it was horrible because yeah. I'm, I'm out of <laughs> shape and stuff. I'm sure there were guys that were with me that were laughing it off, but I didn't see them at the time. Yeah, you know? yeah. And then there's guys that had it a lot worse than I did. But for me, it was, it was awful. I remember... Just be the middle of the packer, huh? <laughs> I was the low middle, but I was crying, man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I remember before boot camp, our basic training in the Army, we call it, I would do 500 push-ups a day because I'm like, you know, you watch the movies and they're like, drop and give me 20. So I would do 500 push-ups a day. I could knock them out at any time. And then I got there and I'm like, oh, I got this. I can do 500 push-ups in a day, right? I can, I can knock out 50 in a set, no problem. So then they don't... It's not like the movies where they go, get down and give me 25. They just go, get, get the fuck down. And then you just start pushing yeah. <laughs> until you have muscle fatigue and you can't do it. So it didn't matter if so it was if you 20, can do 30, 500, you're doing. Yeah, you're still doing 500. <laughs> and then when you're done, then they start screaming at you. You can't pick up your body anymore. And then, and then you roll over and you do flutter kicks and then you crawl around on your face. And cause you know, the BDUs that you wear yeah. you have your shirt. At, on a daily basis in Georgia, we would sweat through, you'd have giant sweat stains, like the back of everybody's, those are thick and your shirt. And you'd have big white lines just from that sweat stain of all that body that's escaping and yeah. stuff. And it's, it's all the mental stuff too, you know, okay. it's hard, but, and it always has been and yeah. it always will be, but, <laughs> or it should be anyway. So he gets drafted. He heads to boot camp. Yeah. So he goes to Fort Ord and by his own words, he actually got there and he's like, this isn't too bad. And then they sent him to Camp Carson, Colorado, where it was freezing. And then he's like, oh shit, what did I get myself into? Because yeah. he's, as he said, he's a Southern California boy and now he's in this freezing, freezing cold yeah. Colorado, high elevation, high and altitude. And now what is he stuff. there for? Just specific training? Basic training still. Okay. Yeah. He's training on the recoilless rifle, which is like a big, like a platform type bazooka. It's a single round. It's this huge, huge weapon. So he's kind of trained up on that, but just like the army always does, they spend all this training time on him, and then they go, "Oh, never mind. Here's your rifle. You're a rifleman, right?" Oh, okay. So he actually volunteered for Korea. He wanted to go fight because, again, just because he was drafted, that wasn't out of um, a lack of willingness. He just he was waiting to get drafted. He got drafted. If it comes, it comes, you know. But I believe when he was drafted, the war wasn't even on yet. He hadn't even really heard of Korea. He knew there was some some yeah. things going on on the other side of the world, but it was meant nothing to a kid from L Street in San Bernardino, you know. Yeah. So he volunteers for Korea, though. He gets sent over, and he actually, uh, they told him he was going to the 1st Cavalry Division, which was my unit, and he thought, that's awesome. They have that cool patch. I'm going to get home, go home yeah. and wear that giant patch. And then they told him, oh, never mind, you're going to the 7th Infantry Division. So he, he wanted to go 1st Cav, but he ended up going that. What's the difference? It's just your unit. Oh, okay. Every unit has their, it's like almost like a football team. You have okay. your pride and stuff yeah. like that. But uh, he gets sent to the uh, 7th, and then they, they're shipping out for Japan. So you like to talk about conditions and stuff. What are people going through? How do you how do you get from uh, Washington State to Japan? 
you take a ship, a troop ship, oh. with thousands of people on the troop ship, right? So for about two weeks, 14 days or so, he's on this troop ship. So if you picture... What does it look Is it a battleship? Similar. Yeah, they're big yeah. Navy ships. Have you ever been on a cruise? Yeah. It's not like that. So <laughs> there's, there's 10,000 guys on there, right? There's no, like... There's, hula, hula girls yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and there, drinks? There's no girls that are hula. There <laughs> might be something. But they have um, bunks that are strung up 10 high. So one body's here, one body's here, one body's here. Ten and that's how you're up. sleeping. 10 high. From floor to ceiling, there's bunks. So his bunk's about four up. So you have to climb over the guys to get there. And then that's where you sleep, rocking with the, in the uh, cradle of the ocean there. So for, you know, about two weeks, you're you going. to be getting sick. Everybody's getting sick. So everybody's throwing up. They're throwing up in the hold. That's where everybody's sleeping. So you're constantly smelling this vomit. Um, according to him, they said they didn't even have, the Navy cooks weren't cooking for him. It would literally be, they'd walk around and they'd go, you, you, and you, you're cooking today. So some hillbilly that's never done anything, yeah. you know, doesn't know anything about food, probably not that sanitary, he starts cooking. So the food's horrible. They have powdered eggs. They're not mixing them right, you know. So Ugh. you get one bite of egg, one bite of runny, and then one bite of the powder still in there. So guys are just vomiting everywhere, and it's just disgusting, miserable, yeah. fatiguing. You're not getting a good night's sleep. Do you get used to it after a while? As much as anything, yeah. yeah. Um, I think human nature, you can get used to anything. People yeah. always do, but it's, it's not. Seasickness is the worst. Dude. Yeah, yeah. It's awful. I'm, I've pr- I haven't had too terrible luck being seasick ever. but I uh, went on a fishing boat one time. Oh, yeah. Oh. It was awful. So imagine that times 14 days yes. where instead of, you know, I, I don't know how it was with you, but usually in the civilian world, somebody's there to go, yeah, you all right, yeah, man? Yeah. In the army, it's get your ass on your bunk and get out of here, you know, shut your mouth. No there's, sympathy. There's no room in the sick bay because everybody you can't call your mom. There. No, yeah. <laughs> and I'm sure the sailors were making fun of the soldiers like crazy. Oh, because they're used to too. it. Yeah, they're used to it. It's nothing to them. Yeah. So then when they get to uh, Japan, they, they get there a brief amount of time, they give them their equipment, and then they're off to Korea. So off he goes. And... Um, just like we mentioned before, these are amphibious invasion troops. They're going in with the Marines. They hit behind the lines, and they immediately start pushing inward. So tactical surprise, it's a huge victory in that sense in Sean. But the negative thing was, one, like I said, we brought the Chinese into the war once they came down. And the other thing is, we're victorious, but we're pushing forward, right? So the troops are getting more and more and more and more and more spread out, right? right. So these, these, these elements are, are very distant. They are, some of these guys are over 200 miles away from other Americans when they get attacked by tens of thousands of Chinese communist forces in North Korea. So they're completely guys. spread up, just not enough guys. So they're just getting smacked hard. And they're fighting through, again, these, these mucky conditions, these mosquitoes, this dysentery, all this stuff after their, their time on the ship, right? Yeah. He comes to a village just like Rodolfo, just like all these other guys. We got to take the high ground. So in um, May of 1951, they find themselves in a village I'm not even going to try to pronounce the Korean name. It's, 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 uh, it's not that hard, but I'll, I'll mess it up anyways. Yeah. And they're given the orders, you need to take that top of the hill because that's that strategic high ground we've right. been talking about. So the Chinese communist forces are entrenched on top of this hill outside the village. We need this vantage point. The hill doesn't even have a name. It's insignificant to history, but it's very significant to the guys that are there fighting and getting killed, right? Yeah. So Company, Company F... Company F is tasked with trying to take this hill. So three times Company F goes up and three times Company F gets repelled. They have five pillboxes on the, on the hill. A pillbox is, we've talked about guys yeah. in trenches and stuff. A pillbox is like a concrete fortification. They have this built up over time. They've been there for a while. They have interlocking fields of fire. Yeah. So if you're running up the hill, you're not getting shot with a machine gun or a guy with a rifle who may or may not be looking at you. You're getting shot at by every angle that's covered on the hill. Think of the hills in Mentone over yeah. here, you know. Think of the exhaustion and the fatigue and all that of trying to get up there. And then any place you go, you're going to get hit. There's nowhere to run. There's nowhere to run. And like we talked about with the high ground, one of the reasons the high ground is so important, you have to stand up and expose yourself to move up. They just have to pop their head out and shoot down. The enemy was actually rolling grenades. They weren't even throwing them. They were pulling the pin and just roll, letting them roll down the hill. So they don't even have to see it's you. that steep. How do you hit something that you can't see, right? Yeah. So they're just literally rolling the grenades down. So... Three company, or I'm sorry, the company fails three times going up and going back down. So then Rodriguez and his squad is sent up there to check it out. So about eight to ten guys. And as it goes, they get pinned down. So immediately they get up there, they duck their heads, and they start getting fired on from all around. Rodriguez says, we couldn't move forward, we couldn't move back, and we couldn't move side to side. They're, they're as good as dead. You can't even retreat because all you're hearing is this machine gun fire. When you look up, to me, this is extra scary because you can't see the enemy. All he knows is the enemy's at the top of the hill. And you're just hearing rounds. You're whiz. just hearing rounds. And we got to get some, like, clips of machine gun fire and stuff on here yeah. so you can hear that. Because the sound is, it's hard to understand if you haven't heard the machine guns. And it's hard to understand if you haven't, uh, you know, been in, heard what a firefight sounds like. That chaotic, um, yeah. just, just everything going on. And 
you know, they might be shooting in different directions, but you're going to feel like it's shooting at you because you're, you're terrified at that yeah. point, right? I mean, again, civilians, um, if, I, if I just fired a gun in a crowd, everyone's going to freak out and they're going to go home and be on Instagram like, I got shot out, the bullet whizzed by my head. No, yeah. it didn't. But now I'm at Amplify that times machine guns, times um, automatic rifles, times pistols, times grenades, times whatever the hell else they have up there, right? In this is where they positions. are. So they're fortified. They know exactly. the, they know the exactly. land. So Rodriguez and his task or his squad are stuck. They can't move forward. They can't move back. So if, if I'm in this position, I'm probably going to put my head down. This is, again, this is where you start crying. This is where you start yeah. praying. This is where you start thinking, what the fuck am I going to do here, right? Guys, you're using your hands to try to dig into the ground a little bit more because any part of your body that's sticking up is going to get hit eventually. So you're trying to, trying to dig down with what you have, the buttstock of your rifle, you know, your, your bayonet, your knife, just trying to get a little hasty position into the ground. Hug that ground as close as you can. Try to make yourself flat so the rounds basically yeah. don't hit you. So Rodriguez is looking around. And instead of getting scared, he gets pissed, right? So he said that um, his dad was from Mexico, and his dad always told him, be a man, son. That's, that's how he was raised. His dad said, be a man. Don't be afraid, even if it takes dying. He basically told him, you know, yeah. everything you do in life, you need to be a man. You need to be courageous, even if it kills you. And if it's going to kill you, don't be afraid. So he later joked, my dad wasn't getting shot out in a hill in Korea <laughs> when he said that, but he took that to heart. So he, he said, I was mad, and somebody needed to do something. So I just did it. Somebody needed to do something, right? It's yeah. not going to be the other guys. They're pinned down. You can't wait for your company. You can't wait for anybody. Someone needed to do someone, something, and I'm somebody, so I'm going to do it. So he stands up. He completely silhouettes himself, and he charges 60 meters forward. This hill is over 100 meters up, but they, they waited for them to get trapped at this crucial point. So uh, Joseph stands up, and he just starts charging forward. He's got a belt full of grenades, and he's got his rifle, and he's headlong charging by himself at the enemy. So he gets to the first gun emplacement as he's pulling his pins on his grenades, and he's throwing them, and he takes out the first pillbox. He gets behind. He starts firing his rifle, moving from pillbox to pillbox. No one's following him. They're still pinned down, and at some point, he realizes he's out of grenades, right? So rather than hitting the dirt, rather than taking shelter in one of these pillboxes he's taken, he runs back down the hill, he grabs everyone else's grenades, and he charges forward. Eventually, he takes out... He goes out, back down to the original position. He went back down to the original pinned-down position, and guys are getting... <laughs> go ahead, man. If you want to do it, go ahead, right? Damn. So he charges forward, and again, these are machine gun emplacements. So one thing he had going for him was he couldn't see the enemy. They're firing kind of wildly, right? So he's moving, moving forward, just taking that momentum, taking that initiative, and he ended up, he ended up killing 15 people single-handed with rifle and grenades and he took out four pillboxes just like we've talked about in a lot of these other actions he broke the back of the, the defense he took the initiative so these again conscripted soldiers a lot of these chinese guys they might not have wanted to be there either they don't know what's going on in the totality they know what's going on in their in their position yes. so they're firing machine guns they're firing machine gun you're hearing your partners in on the the flanking position or on on your left Firing, all of a sudden you hear that gun silenced, right? That's a scary thing, too, explosion. if you put yourself in the enemy position. So you don't know what's going on. You're and if thinking, you're in a pillbox, you can't see, right? Not necessarily, yeah. It's depending on which way you're faced. If you're doing the right thing, you're focused on your sector of fire. All you know is we have this overwhelming fire superiority, but now it's going away. I'm hearing one gun go down. I'm hearing two gun go down. Yeah. You don't know if you're getting attacked by a division size element, a platoon, you know, a hundred guys. You don't know what it is. All you know is that... Your line's breaking. Yeah. All you know is, you know, you went to, you know, a street fight with five dudes and everybody else is knocked out and you're like, oh shit, now yeah. I'm by myself. So then the next thing you see, again, you look up and you see this skinny little Mexican kid from San Bernardino and he's got his rifle pointed in your face and he starts blasting and he takes over that position. No prisoners in this one. Kills 15 in action. Eventually the American troops follow him. They take control and they're able to take control of that hill. Wow. So again, one man with courage makes a majority, right? Yeah. A whole company-sized element, 100 to 200 guys, couldn't get up, couldn't get up that hill. And that's not because they were weak or they were cowards or they were pussies. It's the same thing. You move forward, everyone's bogged down. It, it's, it's suicidal to get up. You wouldn't want it. If everybody started doing that, you're going to lose the war real quick. Yeah. You know, you're going to start losing too many bodies. So they're doing what they're supposed to do. They're staying down. They're following their squads. But Rodriguez was mad. He was mad that his buddies were pinned down. He was mad that no one could move, and he was mad that these guys were stopping him. So he refused to be stopped, and he went forward. And it's weird. The psychology of battle is so interesting because the fact that the, the enemy is winning, right. it creates this confidence within them exactly. to where they're almost not taking a single threat serious. Right. So without that pin down initially, like you said, if everyone was running up, it would right. they'd be taking it a lot exactly. more. Exactly. You know Everybody I mean? would be up in a firing position. They would be on their machine guns. So that guns. may they'd not have worked targets. then. 
he didn't even see the enemy. He said, all I knew was that the, the bad guys were at the top of the hill, so that's where I was going. He's just charging forward to muzzle flashes and throwing grenades and just fighting like a maniac, like a berserker. Yeah. Had they been in more exposed positions, yeah, they might have seen him. They might have got him. But he didn't even get hit in this engagement. Bullets are hitting the dirt around him. You know, some of these guys might not have been as well trained. They might have been scared. How, are you, other... how are you pulling the pin if you got your rifle well on you. So he's slinging his rifle while oh, he's okay. doing the grenades. You, you got to do one or the you other. You got to commit to yeah, one or the other. Yeah, you got to commit to one or the other. And he went with the grenades. I would never, ever go with the grenades. Yeah. But he's going with the grenades. He probably threw a lot better than I did. Probably intimidating as an enemy, though. Like oh, yeah. If, and it's, it's and, a lot easier to come up on a rifle guy. Well, it's not only if that. He's just charging with grenades. You don't, wanna be a, you don't want him to see you. You got to go back to the reality, too, that people don't understand is that guns aren't that easy to fire. Yes. It's not so like. Funny. I mean, a rifle is much easier than a pistol, but. And again, not to... Shooting is not easy. Right. And not to denigrate the Chinese and the North Korean troops either, but uh, I doubt that they went to long basic trainings and had all this training and stuff or what the condition of their rifles or their machine guns were. Yeah. If if I, again, I would never even want an automatic rifle like an AR-15. I want a single, I I want a uh, semi-automatic because I can't hit shit when I'm going auto. If you go on full auto, it's not... Very inaccurate. I was a machine gunner. I like my machine gun, but yeah, it's inaccurate to fire a rifle. uh, I think they were called Papa shells. I'm not sure, but popping those things, the rounds are just going all over the place it's not that easy now you add that to it that you have a fast moving target that you need to shield yourself from yeah you can't just stand there and you know line up your rear and front side and breathe in and breathe out and squeeze that trigger you can't do all that you're firing they're firing if you stay um if you don't take that enemy out the enemy's going to take you out right so you need to pay attention to what you're doing but it's you can't follow all those fundamentals like that Uh uh-huh right yeah so there's all that human nature element going on. And then, like I said, there's that element of surprise as well. There's, they might be firing down at the Americans they have pinned down and not realize they're being flanked, not yeah. by a unit, but in this case, by a single guy. But a single guy with a rifle is just as devastating. And, and tons of grenades. Tons sounds of grenades. Like a, it yeah, sounds like, went a back and got, or exactly. sound like a full force of guys. Exactly. Yeah, it, the, it, the psychology of battle is so interesting because it changes minute to minute, second to second. Like what you might tolerate, what you might take serious and as when, an enemy force. You keep saying the psychology of battle. To me, everyone's brave in a crowd, right? If, yes. you're, if you're winning, it's easy. Yes. You know, when, Everyone when, likes to be the hammer, dude. Right. When you start seeing guys go down around you and stuff, that's where you see what people are made out of. Yes. That's where you're going to see certain guys that are going to stand up and you're going to see other guys that are going to buckle and go, oh my God, we're dying, we're dying. Yeah. There's a lot of battles that were lost that could have been won. You know, you, if you go through history and stuff, there's, there's major battles where people thought they were outnumbered and they thought they were defeated and they were treated and they weren't. They just didn't know they were getting attacked a certain way. Yeah, it's way not like you have broke. a commentator going, oh, right. here he comes with the grit. You exactly. know what I mean? Yeah. You don't know the... It's, mm-hmm. it's like going to a live sporting event, man. If you go to like a live UFC event or something, it's, you don't realize how much the commentating you know, right. teaches you about what's going on. Exactly. Cause some, I went to a live UFC my first time and you're like, what's going on? Yeah. Like who's winning? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? You almost have to be told. Yeah. And imagine that in battle, man, where you don't have a clue. There's no, you're in the trees. Right. You know what I mean? And everything's scary to you at that point yeah. because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you win or lose. It doesn't matter if, uh, you know, we lose 10 guys or we lose a thousand guys. If you're one of those guys that dead, it's dead, you're just as dead yeah. as if, if you won the battle or lost it. So you, at the end of the day, you're thinking about yourself too. Self-preservation. So, right. right. Yeah. So it's, it's, there's a lot of that going on and that's why small numbers of guys are able to do things like this or one guy yeah. with that courage and initiative is able to take the tide and push back the enemy. And then again, one man with courage makes a majority. He's moving forward. Now all these other guys find the courage to pick up and move. Yeah. They also have less enemy that's firing down on him because he's yeah. been able to kill these 15 guys. And again, 15 may not sound like a crazy number, but in reality, it's a lot. It's a lot. And again, these aren't, these are machine gun positions, fortified machine gun positions. If you gave 50 guys pistols, and you gave one guy a 240 Bravo, good night to the guy with the pistols, right? Yeah. It's, not, it's not as simple as... It's not even. Yeah, they're force multipliers, you call right. them. You know what I mean? This, this one guy with... Or you'd want a, couple, a crew, you know, give them an AG and an ammo bear and stuff. Yeah. Three guy machine gun position. You can, you can hold a line all day long. Yeah. Look at World War I. Look at the, um, yeah. the, the kill percentages of the machine gunners versus the riflemen. The riflemen weren't doing a whole hell of a lot in yeah. those engagements. Those machine gunners were just cleaning house when, when the enemy would, would come forward frontally at them through the trenches. How many times do you think it happened where the guy got that courageous thing, went up, killed people, and then nobody followed him? And he just died at the top. Well, you know how many I mean? exactly? Or, and how many times was it when the guy got the courage and he jumped out of the trench and, boom, and then he got dead. shot immediately? Yes. And then the next guy that saw that wisely said, "I'm not going to do that." Exactly. That's why we have There's the Medal of Honor, and that's why of it's rare. Of those. Exactly, because you know every I mean? every 
it wouldn't be a heroic thing if everybody could just exactly. jump out of the trench. And it's not as simple as, oh, well, why were those other guys, you know, why didn't they just get up and do it? Because they probably would have got killed. Yes. If he would have done it again, he probably would have got killed. Yep. But all, all... If all five of them went at once, yep. it probably would have caught their eye easier. Exactly. Or maybe it would have given them a more focused position to shoot at. Or it has to be one. It right. had to be at that moment. Yep. Yeah, sometimes a, a small number is better than a large number. Right. So it's, it's a job for many or few, and yeah. not, not somewhere in the middle. And have he's you ever played Capture it. the Flag? Yeah. Yeah, ca- capture the flag. Similar. If everyone's going after the flag, right? Then the defenders are going to come back to right. the flag. Everybody's but if you're pay not attention. paying attention, right. you got your little fast guy that sneaks around and back. <laughs> He's like, "Whoa, he just did some crazy stuff." Well, right. it took everything to get that p- to happen. You know, at that specific moment. You know, it's kind of crazy, man. So I'm going to go ahead and read his citation here for, for clarity. And I touched on a lot of it, but just so we uh, we're consistent on these. So again, born in San Bernardino, California, November 14th, 1928. Sergeant Rodriguez, I know me back up real quick. He was actually a PFC at the time. If you haven't noticed so far, Laz- Corporal um, Hernandez was a corporal. Clarence Kraft was a private. Joe Sakata was a private. Tim No was a private. These are all very lower enlisted guys. Yeah. More, more PFCs, privates, specialists, and corporals have the Medal of Honor than generals do. You know? Really? It's generally going to be that lower, lower enlisted guy who just has it in him. Right? Yes. I always, I always think that's awesome, and it doesn't get touched on a lot. Yeah. You know? I remember that is cool. when I was in the Army, my buddy uh, Chuck Smith, he's a, uh, I think he's a first sergeant now. He's a uh, ranger instructor, all the whole nine yards. But he went to a, a class for the, I think it was a tow missile class, and we were younger enlisted guys, and um, one of the um, NCOs there told, at, said, like, hey, how come you can't do this, or, or told him to do something. He's like, hey, I'm just a private, and then that's what the guy, he said, more privates have the Medal of Honor than Sergeant Majors, so get your ass, you know, don't, oh, don't wow. ever use that as an excuse again. Yeah. And, like, and that spoke to him, and then he told me, and I was like, yeah, that's really cool when you think about yeah, it. Yeah, and then another, another thing, when you're a private, you're more likely to stay pinned down, or you're yeah, more likely to follow because you're looking to your suit. leadership. Yeah. And, and Rodriguez actually mentioned that earlier when he was in Korea, when they asked him, they were asking him about the big picture, you know, will that inch on this and that, and he said, I didn't know any Thing. He said, all I knew, I didn't know what direction I was facing. I didn't know where I was. All I knew was they told me where to go and I went. Like, yeah. you know, he didn't get the big scheme of things. Yeah, you he don't said, have like this, the, this yeah, playbook. The sergeants have a plan and they have the maps and the officers are telling them and stuff. But at the lower level, he's just trying to stay alive. There's a hill. The enemy's that way. Okay, yeah. I'll keep my defenses up, right? But, so but when it comes time to go, it's go time. All right, so here's a citation. Sar- or Sergeant, at the time, PFC Rodriguez distinguished himself by conspicuous gallant- gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty in action against an armed enemy of the United States. Sergeant Rodriguez, an assistant squad leader of 2nd Platoon, was participating in an attack, an attack against a fanatical hostile force occupying well-fortified positions in rugged commanding terrain. Again, you got to go back to that terrain. I think about it with the firefighters that are up in the hills right now yeah. fighting those fires and push, how exhausting and how terrible that is, you know, and yeah. they, they probably know it more than most of us would. But just, just now imagine getting shot at and having to keep yeah. your head down and, and fight inch for inch. All right. When his squad's advance was halted within approximately 60 yards by a withering barrage of automatic weapons and small arms fire from five emplacements directly to the front and left flanks, together with grenades, which the enemy rolled down the hill towards the advancing troops. 60 yards... If you made me do a 60-yard sprint right now, I'm probably yeah. going to gas out and just fall. Me I mean, that's, an athlete, it's nothing. But, but now add the field gear. Now add all your equipment. Add now the add, all, add the stress. The add fatigue. your canteens of water. Add your rifle. Add everything else you're carrying, right? 60 yards uphill facing the enemy. Fully aware of the odds against him, Sergeant Rodriguez leapt to his feet, dashed 60 yards up the fire-swept slope, and after lobbing grenades into the first, fox, first foxhole with deadly accuracy, ran around the left flank, silenced an automatic weapon with two grenades and continued his whirlwind assault to the top of the peak, wiping out two more foxholes, and then reaching the right flank, he tossed grenades into the remaining emplacement, destroying the gun and annihilating its crew. Rodriguez's intrepid action exacted a toll of 15 enemy dead, and as a result, his heroic display of valor, the defensive opposition was broken and the enemy routed, and the strategic strong point secured. His unflinching courage under fire and inspirational devotion to duty reflect the highest credit upon himself and uphold the honored traditions of military service. Wow. If you see pictures of Rodriguez, I've I've talked about this almost every episode, right? Yeah. (laughs) Very skinny looking little kid, right? He's not, you know, teeny tiny. He's not diminutive or anything like that, but he does not look like the kind of guy. He's not staccato. Right. If you were, if he, if you were looking for guys to go again in that alley fight to join you, he wouldn't be the guy you'd pick on your side. You wouldn't pick him for football or anything like that. He's a skinny looking little kid, but he's the one that had that courage and initiative to get up. 
like we talked about with some of these actions too, this isn't, you know, when, when this was over, the, the, the clouds didn't open up and the sun didn't shine on him. And it wasn't like, you know, you're a hero now. It was, all right, let's keep fighting. What's next? So he continued to fight for another week until he was seriously wounded in action, right? So he made it through all that. And then he was seriously wounded in action and he was sent to Japan to heal for weeks and months. And he actually was over there and he said, not, I don't want to go home or I want to go home or, you know, thank God I made it. He said, I want to go back to my unit. Those guys are over there still fighting. I, I need to be with my guys. And they told him, you can go back and train with them, but you can't fight because we're putting you in for a medal. And he goes, okay, like, I don't care. Get, let me go back to my guys. He didn't even know what the Medal of Honor was. He said yeah. one medal was the same to another to him. So they ended up sending him back to Korea. He got to stay with his guys, but no more action. So they didn't want they didn't a potential want him to die. Medal of Honor yeah. winner, or what do you call it? Medal of Honor recipient. Recipient, yeah. die yeah, that's, before. That's always a huge public relations nightmare. And yeah. it's happened several times that, uh, again, Clarence Craft went back and fought in Korea. And a lot of guys do go back in action, but as a rule, they try to keep him out. Have you ever heard of John Bassalon? Uh-uh. He's one of the Marines' greatest heroes. He uh, earned the Medal of Honor on Guadalcanal in uh, 1942 in the early stages of World War II. Yeah. We'll talk about him maybe one day. Super heroic action. Um, he became one of the worst, first war heroes of World War II. He was on the war bonds drives, you know, his pictures everywhere and this and that. He felt guilty because he's back home, you know, yeah. living the good life and all his guys are out there. So the quote is, I want to be back with my boys. They sent him to be um, like a drill instructor, like a a machine gun instructor at boot camp. So he's training him, and then he ended up going back to fight at Iwo Jima, and he ended up being killed in action, earning the Navy Cross when he was killed. Yeah, and he had already he was a Medal Medal of Honor Honor recipient, and and then and a Navy Cross recipient. He he, yeah he he didn't want to sit the war out while other guys were fighting, so he ended up fighting. So yeah, it's the same. They didn't want Rodriguez or some of these other guys or Hiroshi Miyamoto. He was in a POW camp, and they didn't want yes. to release that he had the medal, you know? Oh, man, how cool is his story, too? Yeah, yeah we'll definitely get to that one, too. Yeah, so uh, they ended up flying him back to Washington. Truman does his Truman thing. You know, I'd rather have the, this medal than be the president of the United States yeah. and gave him the Medal of Honor. And then he said he finally started realizing how big of a deal it was because he's, yeah. he's getting flown to Washington, and the president of the United States is there. Dang. So he ended up making a career out of the Army. He did 30 years. He went back to Korea. He served in Vietnam. He served in Panama, Bolivia, Puerto Rico, all over the world. He married a girl from Colton that uh, was, a, you know, a, like a, a high school sweetheart type thing. And he, awesome. he was married to her for 52 years. Um, used to eat at Arthur's over there in Mentone. They got his picture We probably on the wall sat there. next to him as kids. <laughs> could have. Definitely could have. We were in there all the time. Yeah, unless he um, was still gone at the time. But my understanding is his, his wife still frequents the area, or she did before this. But So she's um, still around? Uh, she was recently. I don't know now with the um, coronavirus yeah. and everything uh, since Arthur's has been closed. But when the, I, I'm so fascinated with where the medals end up. <laughs> the because physical medal? It, yeah, because yeah. I just feel like at some point it goes into a great, great grandkid's hands who goes, what the hell is that? Man? Yeah, definitely. You know what I mean? A lot of them get donated back. Um, some of them are at West Point for the officers donate theirs like i said sal juntas is is with the 173rd airborne a lot of them stay with family members but have you ever held one you haven't yeah right? i have you at, have at the golf tournament oh you got to hold but it you get a lot of um a lot of the family you might have a great grandson that's a true that does something like but most of them are very, yeah, I would very imagine. proud and and understand that the, the, the i believe one of uh, rodriguez's son became an officer and went to west point and actually made a career out of the army as well so cool. i'm Sam sure they hold boy. Him in, in, in high esteem yeah, and like we talked about with Sakato and everything else, if you read um, Joseph's, Joseph's interviews, he talked about he's very proud to have the medal, and he wears it as a re- representation of himself. But the one interview that I read that he was talking to the guy, he, when he was asking him, what does it mean to you? How does it change your life? And one of the biggest things he would talk about is that it allows him to go talk to the youth of the nation, and he's very proud to do that. And he said, you know, he sees these kids struggling, and he sees things like that, but one of the things that he imparts on these guy, kids is how good they have it to be Americans and how lucky we are and how grateful he yeah. is to be an American. That's awesome. Um, he says, uh, America's the greatest country in the world, so spread the wor- word. And then he said, his, one of his quotes was, um, I'm an American. We're called Hispanic Americans because of our heritage, and I'm proud of my heritage. But remember, most of all, you're American. You are America. So that was his final, you know, they didn't ask him, what do you think about being Hispanic? What do you think about yeah, being American? Yeah. They just asked him, like, what, is, what does this mean to you? And, and his, his closing statement was, be proud to be an American. You are American. You are America. And that's, you know, that's huge for nowadays, but it's huge for all time. When yes. people want to say, like, oh, I hate this country. They do this and that. It's not they do. It's you do. We do. We are America. Yes. And he was America. San Bernardino Valley College, San Bernardino High School, San Bernardino Primary Schools. L Street was where I found his address on his, on his um, draft registration. You know, I don't know how long he lived there, but he grew up in this area. This, this is his home. 
this is our home. This is our county. You yeah. know, all these people. He that is are us. Here. This yeah. is us. This is the fabric of America. Was was Joseph Rodriguez, who from San Bernardino. Joseph Rodriguez's dad, who was born in Mexico. That's America. You know, yes. Clarence Kraft, who's from San Bernardino. He's whiter than anybody. He's he's America. Uh, Rodolfo Hernandez from Colton. He's America. We're America. These guys are America. Yeah. This, this is the best we have, and and they should be remembered for that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's a perfect way to end it. Yeah. Good story, man. So we cool. will be back next week. And like, comment, and subscribe. Try to try to do a couple more local guys, and then we'll yep. keep going. Thanks, guys.